David? All right, David, you're our final speaker. Thank you, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> you'll know some of my speakers that I asked about getting information out to your constituents and your public on the budget process. Uh, I asked Mr. Cohen earlier, or challenged him about being old and ugly, and I wasn't when I arrived here in the city 18 years ago. But I've been at many, many <laughs> budget hearings over the years. And one thing I noticed that this year, I can't see into the future between now and you, when you pass a budget on June the 30th. And I'm concerned about that. I'm concerned about the rules passed on January, in January this year, that limits the community and limits absentee residents serving our nation in harm's way from having an ability, even though they engage in our city throughout that service and are actively involved in things that we do in our city, they have no voice tonight. So please, let's find a way to either use the rules that allow you on a two-thirds vote to suspend those rules for a legitimate purpose when the community brings you the voices of people who have no voice but serve. Please, you have one of the most excellent websites around, like our police department's website, jam full of information. We wish there was 2011 information from the police department on the annual report but we plead with you to give us a better picture of the budget process coming up so we know when to come down and provide you with some solutions. Thank you. All right. Thanks, David. All right. We are now on to our budget um, as it relates to our Sacramento Police Department. And uh, we're going to have our city manager kick it off and then our chief of police and the rest of our esteemed finance department will be joining us. Thank you, Mr. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Let's see. There we go. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, as I uh, uh, said at our first budget hearing this afternoon, these are presentations first by the police department and then by our parks and recreation department. And uh, there is no action, formal action required of, of council nor, nor one needed. Uh, and so uh, these are hearings. Uh, give us a chance to provide information to the public, uh, both those present and those watching, as well as take questions and uh, then entertain questions from the, or comments from the public. So to uh, start us off, uh, uh, Chief Rick Brazil will present uh, the city manager's budget for the police department. Mayor, members of the council, Rick Brazil, your police chief. Um, what I thought I'd do is, is kind of uh, first um, give kudos that you have the finest police department in this nation and uh, all you have to ask is is those folks across the country and the mayor hears that when he's traveling and I want to give kudos to the men and women because as we talk and you we kind of go over the history of our budget cuts you'll see that there's been dramatic reductions yet they continue to perform exceptionally well every single day so kudos to them um, this is the fifth time I've presented a budget to you as your chief and the fifth budget reduction I've presented to you. Um, so like the, ma the manager said, there is no good answer here and it's, we're doing the best we can with what we have. But to give you a historical perspective in how we formulated the cuts, it just didn't start this year, it started five years ago. And it started with 14 town hall meetings, online surveys, and we updated the online survey fall of last year to identify what our community expects out of its police department. Um, with that, the proposal that you see in front of you for this year's reduction looks very similar to the proposal last year uh, because it is. Um, the reductions last year, fortunately, at the bottom end were restored due to some success with grants. A couple clarifying features, um, if pieces of information that are important for the community to, to understand is when you look at our, our budget reduction within the staff report, it talks about um, the reduction of 109 police officers. Uh, that is done 60 of those are on a grant that we expect to be restored so really the reduction is 49 sworn and 10 civilian so I want to make sure that it's very clear early on um, the goals for the police department have remained the same since 2008 2008 to, to today 
and that is we want to reduce serious crime, make sure we invest in our employees because they are our greatest asset, and then at the same time we provide great customer service. Um, kind of an anecdotal story, in the, the same amount of time we've been reducing our staff, our complaints from the community have gone down 42 percent. Those are huge numbers for any organization, but uh, you've got staff out there and police officers who are really getting the job done, and the community appreciates it. Uh, our core mission and how we adapt it and cut our budget is that we continue to focus on answering 911 calls. If we fail to answer the 911 calls, we failed as a city, and that we have enough resources on the street to respond in the cases of emergency, both from the community and from um, officers out there in the field. Some information on reductions. Since we started cutting back in the 08-09 uh, uh, fiscal year, we've reduced our budget 32 percent, which is fairly consistent with the rest of the city. Um, but budgets don't provide services people do. And so when we look at our staffing numbers, both in the civilian and the sworn classifications, those are reductions that we've had. Um, if you recall back in 08-09 when I talked about the uh, survey we did with the public, that process was part of putting together a master plan. At that point in time, based on community expectations, we're about 500 positions below what the community expected us to be at for performance level. If you add, keep that same performance levels, which they, they reaffirm in fall of this year, it puts us at about 900 positions below what we need to adequately provide policing services to the city. Um, the cuts, as this includes as proposed in the budget, um, and so from 08 through proposed, we've reduced our staffing by 153 sworn positions, 217 civilian positions. Uh, we've closed three of our four public counters. We currently only have one public counter open. That's at our headquarters in the south area. And we've reduced our overtime budget 53 percent. That's addition to the um, service reductions, which I'll get to in just one second. In our proposed budget, we have the reduction of, like I mentioned, 49 positions. Uh, that includes, in the reductions, um, 15 detectives uh, returning back to uh, patrol. When I talk about returning to patrol, that's where the layoffs occur. The reductions occur actually at the, the, the lower ranks as far as seniority. So we need to keep patrol fully staffed, so that eliminates 15 detectives in patrol. Much like we talked about last year, that means that um, property crimes that we're currently doing follow-up on, some of those will not be followed up on. We'll continue to investigate the homicides, the sex assaults, the child abuses, the spousal abuses, those type of crimes will continue to be investigated. What we don't, won't be able to do is follow up, do that extra investigative follow up on most of our property crimes. Uh, our traffic enforcement section, that would be what you would call the motor officers, those on, on motorcycles, that is eliminated. We will keep our DUI team, that's on a grant, so our drunk driving enforcement team will continue, that's on a grant. And those motor officers will be returned back to patrol to uh, assume patrol functions. Uh, additionally, we went through and looked at what we're calling the, what I refer to as the non-enforcement positions. We're sworn or in positions of non-enforcement capacity, and we're re returning, um, there's 21 total FTE cuts there, both a mix of civilian and sworn. Uh, some of those are immediately on July or June 30th when the new fiscal year takes effect. Others will be phased in between now and the, the end of the calendar year. So for example, our volunteer coordinator uh, is currently a sworn officer. That position will be eliminated, but he's, we're going to basically train the volunteers to run the volunteer program. So the volunteer program will not go away, it's just that coordinator will be phased out, will be returned to patrol, and then the volunteers will run the volunteers. So there'll be some that are immediate phase-outs, others that will um, be phased in over time. What that means in the reduction in the administrative portions is we'll just continue to be delayed in responding back to the community and customer service. Um, most of the positions that are up there, the 21 that I'm talking about, are currently vacant. We stopped hiring uh, in the fall of last year, anticipating budget cuts. So those service delivery reductions that we see now, the delays will just continue into the next fiscal year. Um, last, I wanted to briefly just talk about some of the mitigation strategies. We've been, uh, we just haven't been sitting by looking at the reductions. We've been trying to anticipate what's going to happen and look at how do we mitigate the reductions in delivery of service. We talked about hotspot policing. Um, you've had those presentations before at council. We continue that, and the captains are expected at the weekly ComStat meeting to address what their hotspots are and what the strategies are they're using to uh, reduce call volume and or crime in those locations. On a regional perspective, we have the benefit right now of some phenomenal uh, department heads in the law enforcement arena. Uh, a sheriff and the police chiefs in the region are working very closely together to look at how do we regionalize responses and where we can't 
because of different political reasons regionalized, we at least try to what we're calling virtual consolidations, where we're coordinating schedules and coordinating activities while we maintain the autonomy of our budgets and our staffing. Uh, so a great relationship within, within the region. On the state, the, the big problem that we're looking at now is realignment. We're at the front end of figuring out what happens with the prisoners who are being pushed back in, onto the counties. Um, and so that is kind of a work in progress. I, I can't give you, a, give you a definitive on what the impacts are, but there will be impacts as the state realigns and pushes responsibility for prisoners back into the local jurisdictions. Um, so what's that mean for the future? You know, I was able to stand up here the last four years and talk about but, um, crime reductions. Um, this time last year we are talking about a 27% reduction in crime. I can't do that this time. Uh, since January of this year, we've actually seen a 7.8% increase in crime. And we expect that trend to continue um, with the majority of the increases being in property crimes, auto thefts, larcenies, and some burglaries. Um, and, but I will save that for a different day when we talk about the impacts of restoration and what the impacts of realignment are and, and what we start seeing on the, on the trends when it comes to crime. That's a different conversation for another day. Um, so with that, um, Mr. Mayor, I've, that's kind of the, the summary of our reductions. Uh, I would like to give one quick update, if I may, on one of the mitigation strategies is um, ceasefire. And I know Councilmember Pennell asked for an update, so we'll give you a more formal update on that, but I wanted to kind of address that while we're here because that is one of our mitigation strategies. Uh, we've, uh, a couple of the grants, including the Cal Grip grant, have expired. Um, we also have a couple grants, uh, the Juvenile Justice OJJ DP grant expires at the end of the year. And so what we currently have is the outreach workers are funded through June. Uh, the SETA coordinator is funded through the end of this year. I know we're working with Jim Combs in the Parks Department, and there's a basically a $1.5 million grant application. Uh, what we foresee on the law enforcement side is the, the um, faith-based community and the CBO is taking more of a uh, leadership role in ceasefire, and we'll support that with our enforcement resources. We'll still be an active partner, but we'll just have to kind of tailor it to where we're more of a, a support role versus a leadership role in ceasefire, and we'll, I'll get you a more detailed update on, on ceasefire at a later date. So that matter, I'm available for any questions. All right, how many members of the public? All right, Chief, we'll hear from the public and then bring it back up. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna start with Brett, I believe it's Danny's, and then we have David Janay, and then Richard Cable. Good evening, council members and mayor, it's Brett Daniels, and I think we're gonna start with a video presentation. The city of Sacramento. Wait, stop the right city down. of Sacramento, the capital of the great state of California. A city bursting with family activity and the love of American tradition. Sacramento, a city which remembers to honor those who currently serve and those who gave the ultimate sacrifice. Sacramento, the city for all Californians to exercise their rights to peaceably assemble and a city for parents to send their children on field trips in order to learn our golden history and see the price of our freedom. In order for Californians to visit their capital, the Sacramento Police Department has remained vigilant in fighting crime and protecting our families. The Sacramento Police diligently work to make our streets safe from crime within our community or from those who come from elsewhere. oath to serve and protect this community in order to have safe neighborhoods for our children to live and play. Unfortunately, crime in this city is growing in spite of valiant efforts of our men and women in uniform. The Sacramento police are pushed to their limits with calls that go unanswered simply because there are not enough officers to protect our ever-growing population. There is a threat to our police not one that comes at the end of a knife or a gun. I am here as a member of the National Public Safety Team. Just want to let you know public safety is the number one priority for us. I hope it is for you. Is that reflected in this chart that I've uh, put here today regarding CSI? These are professionals who help our police identify and capture criminals. They collect evidence so that the district attorney can prosecute offenders and find justice for victims. I'm going to go real fast because I know you have a time limit. I find it sadly ironic that on the very day the city of Sacramento is considering reducing the number of police officers in what is already the lowest staffed police department for a city the size of Sacramento in the nation and thus not only jeopardizing the citizens but also the men and women of the Sacramento Police Department that on this very day, National Law Enforcement Memorial Day, 
Our nation is honoring more than 19,000 law enforcement officers killed in the line of duty throughout our country's history. Correct. I pray, I'm going to close them up right now. Thanks. I pray your final decisions on the budget do not contribute to another officer being added to that total. As a former city council member, I fully understand the struggle with funding all that are looking for and need help. But as an elected official, your number one priority must be to the citizens as a whole, and that must start with adequate funding for police services. This must be not only in your words, but your actions. I pray each of you have the courage to do the right thing. Thank you, Mayor. Thanks, Brad. David. David, Janae. All right, we got David and then Richard, I believe. All right. Yeah, I am okay. not David Janae. Are you Richard? <laughs> Richard came up. All right. Am I? He's better looking than I am. <laughs> And my Much connection to Sacramento goes back to 1850 when my ancestors settled here in Sacramento, Midtown, and Downtown. My grandfather was a fire chief of Sacramento, turn of the century. His son, uh, my uncle, was a fireman. And I have two plots at the city cemetery that I look at after religiously. So I have a vested interest in Sacramento. I want to bring your attention to the communications center staffing trend. This is a department that responds to 9-11 calls, emergencies calls, et cetera, to the police department. And as you can see, from 2007 to 2012, there's been a reduction each year in the number of people working in that department. The last figures I have are from 2010, 700,000 calls were made into that department. That's a lot of calls. What's troubling to me, though, is 18,000 calls to 9-11 were never completed. In other words, someone got disconnected, they dropped the phone, got to the wrong department, and I think that's a worry. Um, you, we, we know that, you, you just heard the fire chief say that criminal activity is increasing, population is increasing, and this apartment needs to be maintained and funded. We need more people in this department, not fewer, just as we need more policemen, not fewer. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks, Richard. David, you're up. Thank you, Brett. Thank you, Rich. Ladies and gentlemen, 18 years talking about budgets. Is public safety our number one priority? We say it usually around election time. Budget time, sometimes I wonder. Now, I missed a little number here because you'll notice that place is blank. It's blank for a reason. When you cut 167 positions from the police department last summer, they went away. Now, interestingly enough, Now that we don't have those community service officers out there to take reports that police officers don't have the time to take because they're running call to call to call, crime is up. You'd expect it to be down. There's the numbers. Now, this is an area that I have some expertise. I want you to know that at the current time, with the current staffing level, the Sacramento Police Department, you have over six times as many convicted felons and people on parole as you do police officers. I don't know what you're laughing about over there, folks. It's not funny. Mr. Fong, you're my council member. I didn't vote for you, and I don't make personal attacks here. Mr. Cohen has been my council member for 18 years. We brought a solution to this council many years ago. It was discounted. It was on how to deal with parole. And we have a solution for you today to backfill the budget deficit in the Sacramento Police Department. And I don't know when we're going to be able to present that to you because of the way the scheduling is done in budget. 20 minutes tonight for the Sacramento Police Department, nine minutes for Parks and Recreation. All right, thank you. Henry Herring. <laughs> Following Henry will be Dustin Smith and Tim Boyd. All right, Henry, Justin, and then Tim.
upside down. Sorry. <coughs> Good afternoon, Mayor, members of the City Council. My name is Henry Harry. I live in District 5, and Mr. Chenier is my City Council member. I want to share some thoughts on the cuts to the police department. If we're saying that uh, public safety, safety is our number one priority, the continuing cuts to the police department contradict that. Just food for thought, this chart here in the red shows that how much we are getting from grant funding. If this grant funding goes away, you know, we're going to be in deeper trouble. Following along with what the Chief of Police was talking about, my numbers might be slightly off, but these are their documents. Uh, in 2007 on this chart, you'll see that we had 804 police positions in the police department. By December of 2010, we were down to 770, and that equated to 1.45 officers per 100,000. And then this last chart, and it's consistent with what the chief was saying, our numbers from the police department at one point recently said that we had uh, 656 officers, uh, and that's a dramatic reduction. And the chief showed a chart today that said this year is going to be funded for, I think, 651. So I want to remind members of this council what some public officials said in this town not too long ago. We are ranked number two in California when it comes to violent crime and property crime. The mayor said that, the chief of police said that, and Lieutenant Bill Champion said that. We have 467 validated gang members in this town. The mayor has said that, and I heard Lieutenant Champion say that. In April of 2011, at the mayor's meeting on crime, Lieutenant Champion said, quote, for 2009 and 2010, we're seeing a steady increase in gang offense reports. I'll conclude with this. Um, public safety must be our number one priority. And two things I'll leave you with. This council needs to create a base number of officers so that we don't go through this every year. What are your final thoughts? Sir? And, and the final thoughts is this. Um, this, this issue, this, this issue with the police department and with the fire department should have been hashed out you know, back in uh, February this year, and it should, it should, we shouldn't be doing this this late in the year. Thank you. <laughs> Mayor, Council, thank you. I'm Dustin Smith, Acting President of the Sacramento Police Officers Association. For some time now, we've been talking about the hard way and the better way. The Sacramento Police Officers Association has taken a very active role in searching for a viable, better way. And we just want to make sure that we, uh, make, well, I'm hoping that you understand, because I know that you've seen the, some of the proposals put forward, that we really are actively working uh, at a very high level towards those solutions. Um, unfortunately, I don't have any um, unique revenue ideas for you today, nor do I believe you would want them from the police department related to enforcement actions. Today, we stand here and we talk about concessions needed by our, our employees of the association. We're talking about deals that were made in 2005, contract promises from 2005. Then 2009, we came forward and we did make major concessions. And we did come forward with, with very viable solutions then that are somewhat similar to what we're discussing today. And we do this as some of the lowest paid police officers in the state of California already. Many times, I stand here and I listen to people talk about the priorities of the city. And with many services, it, we can sit and have discussions about what is a priority and where they rank. But when, you come to, when it comes to public safety, there really is no discussion as far as priority is concerned. I hope today somebody walks away with this instead of the word priority. We are an obligation. Public safety is the, probably the number one obligation of a government entity. We're not a priority. We're a must. We already stand here discussing how we're 150 police officers down, 38 CSOs from last year. Our civilian CSI is gone. That's not to mention the over 200 other civilian employees that we no longer have here providing services for the police department. There's been much talk about where the city of Sacramento ranks statewide as far as being a business-friendly community. It's no wonder to me that we're at the bottom of that list considering we're the second most violent city in the state of California. We, uh, they, they coincide. I'm disheartened with the realignment proposals that are coming forward from the state. The numbers we talk about and the crime rates rising are only going to worsen as up to, well, potentially up to 70,000 
prisoners are released back into the community of California, back into the state of California, by approximately 2017. These are horrific numbers. Dustin, we're going to need your final thought, please. Okay. My final thought is I stand before you today on National Police Memorial Week, and today was actually the 31st annual National Police Officers Memorial Service. None of these officers or law enforcement officials gave their life because of pay or benefits. They did it because it was, as it was expected. It was expected by the community. It was expected by their brothers and sisters within law enforcement, and more importantly, it was expected of themselves and their families. So I ask you to please remember that today, and that uh, you also remember that there's no, uh, no action necessary today. We really are working towards a viable solution through the negotiations team. Thank you. Thanks, Dustin. Tim. Well, here we go again, City Council. You guys have a tough challenge in front of you. Um, with this realignment issue getting ready to take place, we have a lot of parolees getting ready to hit the streets, coming down to our county jails. The jails are already over flooded, so that means a lot of early releases. And we already know who gets these things. I mean, you know, these parolees are going to come back into the same low area income neighborhoods that they came from. All the parole houses are either going to be in District 2, in District 5, or District 8. So I encourage all three of you to definitely be as diligent as you can to fight any kind of further cuts that we have. And I think I challenged all of you last week, and especially you, our city manager, to look at some of the stuff we have. This gentleman was talking about how you lay out the budget so that we can get these things ahead of time and we can look at things, make recommendations, and start seeing where some of this fat on the top can be trimmed to save what we really need if you want to be very true and genuine about public safety. Starts here. And please, for the two of you that are always snickering when people are talking to you, Laughs Unlimited is an old sack. This is not comedy hour. Thank you. Show some respect. Okay, the next speaker then is, I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly, Anil Nair, Nair, and then Aaron Donato, and Mac Worthy. All right, sir, you want to come up first? And you probably should say your name to make sure we get it correctly. Yes, please. My name is Anil. 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 Thank you. And Mr. Dave Janay has a video that he likes to sh that we would like to share. Information Bravo 35 to start 319 12th Street. They're saying 10 minutes ago the complainant was 211 at gunpoint. I'm still waiting for any information at all. So we had 211 at gunpoint. Granted, it was about 10 minutes ago when I talked to someone involved. That's a code for fire. Didn't have the 29th and J. John, so they're checking that one out. I still don't have anyone available. I'm here to show my support for the police officers. I think we need more help, and they do a great job, but we all know they're understaffed. Thank you. Thank you. Aaron? Council, my name is Aaron Donato. I'm the lead negotiator for the Sacramento Police Officers Association. And I came here today to talk about three, three main points. Uh, the first one is to ask you to hold off on uh, passing this intent motion today. Um, the SPOA is actively engaged in off-the-record discussions with the City of Sacramento. Um, look, Bonnie and Daryl and Kevin, Robert, Steve, Sandy, we've, we've worked together for a long time. You guys have known me for 12 years. And um, I'd like to think that I have a, a, a reputation of high ethics with you guys. And I'm telling you, that um, a proposal has been given to the City of Sacramento that we think the membership would pass or at least strongly consider, and we think that it meets or exceeds um, the City of Sacramento's financial burden. Um, a, couple of other, a couple of other points here uh, concerning City Manager John Shirey. We're not, con we're not convinced that John is necessarily exercising or executing the will of the council. And the reason for this, the reason for this is because on January 25th, Mark Tyndale stood where I am today and they were talking about 
take-home vehicles. And Steve Cohn asked John to deal with that in the off-the-record discussions. And so far, the city has refused to do that. Additionally, if you haven't seen something that looks like this, and I can't show this to you because um, we have ground rules with the city, but if you haven't seen a form that looks like this, and in talking to you guys, I don't think that you have, then uh, this memo from the city that clearly says in the first paragraph that the council was shown our proposal is not true. The other part is we asked for a salary survey to be done. And you'll see the last paragraph says that they expected that salary survey to be done in the second week in May. Sorry, that's the middle paragraph. Hey, Aaron, we're going to need your final thought, please. All right. My final thought is this. To the citizens of Sacramento, I'll talk to that camera real quick. My name is Aaron Donato. I'm a police dispatcher. I'm not a hired union hack. I'm not a big union boss. I make $65,000 a year. I want to see the city's budget fixed just as bad as you do. I'm tired of reading about it in the paper. We have solutions to offer to the council. We want to work with them. We want to work with you guys. I have an olive branch. I'm here to extend it. I want you guys to take us up on it. Please. We don't want to see these draconian cuts the chief is proposing. We have solutions. We can work this out. All right, Count Vice Mayor Ashby. Aaron. So just on your first point, I wanted to just let you know that a change that actually City Manager Shirey has done, I know in the past we've done these intent motions, which is what you're asking us not to do, right. and he's changed that policy. So actually what's on agenda today is not an intent motion. It's just receive and file, so it's a discussion. So on that first issue, we did, and he did it for exactly the reason that you stated, to allow the conversation to continue. So I want to make sure that you understand it's important since you're the lead negotiator. Thank you. And, and thank you then, Mr. Shirey. Um, please, Council, instruct Mr. Shirey to come back to the table with us and have a, have a two-way dialogue, a meaningful dialogue, because I know we can fix this. All right. Thank you, sir. We appreciate it. Mac. And after Mac is Henry Harry. For each letter, public safety and education, over $10 million a year is spent. What are we afraid of? Per letter, over $10 million is spent. But nobody really come and educate the people about what the police department is about. Just like the people come here and say they're harassing me over in the park, I was over there, how I was involved in something else and didn't see it. When the chief came on and he was on 2nd Avenue, I asked him what he was going to give us whole park. He said, some rookies. The young man in Roseville was my choice, but we got lied to. But anyway, we're going to have to have a cut and people, the police does not keep the peace. We keep the peace and the police come to try to restore the peace. And that's what a misunderstanding. If the people come out and sit down and talk to the people that's unaware that you have a right beyond the policeman when you are not involved in crime. And when those involved in crime, the type of crime here in this city is petty crime. Only one bone robbery came through here in 1965. They didn't bulge in with guns and shoot at him. Because they didn't know who he was when the FBI just saw him rob the Wells Fargo Bank. Why so abusive because you got a gun? 90% of the arrests have been in this town, since so I've been here over 50 years, could have been done with a handshake. But they didn't. It's how they approach. If you approach a bear, he's going to eat you. Approach a bear with something that that bear is going to be afraid of. And that's how you're doing today. Shake hands. On the streets uh, from Broadway to Stockton Boulevard, not one policeman can call a name or a person if they're not a parolee on each kind. That's sad, people. Matt, we need a final thought, please. The cut got to be, because there's a lot of abuse of funds within the administration, not only here, all of America. Make the cut, and crime not going to go up, because this system produces crime. And we're going to live with it. All right, Henry Harry, you're up. 
All right, thank you very much. Ron Emsley. And then we have Greg and one speaker after that. Uh, marginal neighborhoods like Oak Park, when you cut back, we really feel it. Some of you live in the green zone. You, you probably will never notice. But uh, when you live on the frontier, it really hurts. Uh, you've been squandering money with the fire department. Uh, hopefully you can uh, re uh, get some of that money and put it on the police department. Um, it's summertime now and we got probably you know, 50 crack hose off and on working Broadway. There's just not enough police. Uh, they try their best. Uh, a Lieutenant Champion is uh, very proactive in reaching out to the community, um, even though his boss is kind of, oh well, marginal. So uh, we, we do have help, but uh, uh, it, I don't want you to take uh, money away from uh, the police department. Uh, you, you, you got this bloated uh, fire department budget. Uh, you've signed lousy contracts with uh, fi uh, local 522. Um, you have feather bedding. Uh, the police department doesn't have feather bedding. Uh, why should the fire department have feather bedding? So I hope that uh, you can um, suck out some of that money from uh, the fire department and uh, put it on the police because life is hell without enough police and uh, uh, they've really improved with the new chief um, in the past it's been kind of uh, the chief's been marginal especially with Artie uh, that was we really went through a bad time with him but uh, anyway uh, I, I hope that you make the right decision. Thank you. Thanks, Rock. You're welcome. Greg and then Kai. Good evening. I'm Greg Hatfield. I'm the Executive Vice President Policy Director on I in Sacramento. And I'd like to thank the Vice Mayor and the City Manager today for coming and kicking off the Neighborhood Summit. And one of the things uh, that the community looked at in relation to the Neighborhood Summit is safe communities, safe neighborhoods. And that brings us to the police department budget. And I in Sacramento <clears throat> has taken a stance that we agree with the city manager's budget. And again, there's the, the easy way and the hard way to, to do it. And every which way the city and SBOI takes, there's something that really bothers us. Last night, I sat down and I read the MOUs from the police department and SBOA. Some of you were not council members back when this was originally done. There's letters of understanding attached to it. And I've got to tell you, I found a couple areas in there that just, just if I could have grown hair back, I would have grown hair back over it. And that was the SPOA release time. Uh, did some quick uh, work today and found out that the five uh, officers or employees of the police department that get time off for union business is five. Last year, 2010-11, they racked up $536,072 worth of time that the city paid. That includes their benefits, their pay, does not include the take-home cars that I believe the five are entitled to. This has gone on clear back eight years. My quick estimate is the city has given a gift to the union of $2.4 million to $3.2 million in those eight years for time off. According to the agreement, if in fact their time goes over the 5,500 hours, which was in the 2010-11 budget, the union pays the city back a small amount of $36 an hour. I feel, and so does I in Sacramento, this is a gift of public funds. If in fact I was an SPOA uh, uh, person paying in my dues, Greg, we need your final thought. I would have a real problem with this if in fact the SPOA takes the hard way and 40 plus officers go, this money is worth some of those officers. So I would ask the council to ask the city manager for a full report on this, go back the eight years of the contract and see what gifts the city has given the union. Thank you very much. All right, Kai Ellsworth. 
our final speaker. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, members of the council. Um, I heard someone earlier, actually, I've heard a couple of people now, say that they're, um, they don't have any creative funding solutions for you. And I'm wondering why, when we're talking about the police force, we're worried about creative funding solutions. Why aren't we talking about taxes? Why aren't we talking about a sales tax? Why aren't we talking about raising the revenue that we need to pay for the police officers that the city needs? I, 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 it, it's a novel concept, and it's not something that I, I see anyone actually doing. But I'm going to say it anyways. Why don't we start with how many police officers we need, figure out how much money we need to pay them, then find ways to include at least letting the voters have the option of passing new taxes in the city. Because frankly, when you go out and talk to people, the number of people who say they would be willing to pay a sales tax in this city, the number of people who say they would be willing to see their taxes go up to keep their police officers is really staggering. We're talking about a police force that for violent crimes is looking at 10 to 15 minute response times and they should be commended for those response times, not condemned for them. Because of the fact that with the handful of officers that they can keep on the streets at any given time, with their lack of overtime budgets, with their lack of officers, is amazing. I, I just don't understand why we're not trying to convince the public that these are services they need. And I think that if you all went out and actually tried to convince your districts, if you all went out and actually explained this to people, they would listen to you. And they would be willing to pay for those basic city services that, in the end, keep us all alive. Thank you. All right, thank you. All right, Chief. We want to come back up. All right, Council, our opportunity to ask questions for the Chief. Uh, Council Member Sheedy. Chief, I have a question for you. It, it's not on the budget. It's just on the realignment al allocation that we that the, some cities got and the county got it in in Sacramento, and we didn't get anything. But in other cities, the city and county got a share. Is there a reason we didn't get something out of that? Yeah, the um, I, I think what you're referring to is the CCP, the Community Corrections Partnership, where the state funds goes okay. to the committee. <laughs> Um, on the committee, there's one city rep, that would be me, and the rest are county reps, which includes probation, sheriff, right. DA, the courts. Each county, in, in conversations we had, each county has a different need based on where they're at. And our immediate need for us in the county was um, jail beds and, and housing. Uh, we've been, um, I'll call it, gingerly encouraging the sheriff's department for over a decade now, and this council is familiar with that, to add more beds um, mm -hmm. because of what ends up happening and just the revolving door we have at the main jail. And so the first thing we need to do is create capacity uh, within, within the CCP capacity to house the prisoners being released from the state. The next round of funding comes through, and, and part of that is going to be because the chiefs in the region are saying, wait a second, we're absorbing more of the responsibilities of supervising folks on the street. We need to figure out how to distribute some of those funds. Uh, we're also working with the governor's office to um, look at direct funding to local law enforcement that doesn't go through the CCP and can't get funneled off. So there's a couple options we're looking at. but Calif California, each of the counties did something unique to that county, and the priority for us in Sacramento was to create more housing, <coughs> housing first, and then the programs, and then, okay. and then the enforcement at the other end. Okay. I just thought they forgot about us. Uh, no. Uh, oh, you're watching we're there. the store, are you? We're there. Okay. So. Uh, another question I had is, because, due to our severe cuts in this proposal that we have here, the police budget has gone up. I know that the, the raises are coming. Is that the reason, or is there other reasons? There, there's other reasons. There's the raises. Uh, there's some corrections that have been done by finance, and thank you, finance, for some underfunding in certain categories. Um, we've also moved some of the things that we're in, and you're going to have to help me out on that one. There's $4 million that used to be funded um, that's now being rolled into the general fund out of the, and I apologize for not under, well, remembering okay. what the terms are. I don't expect you to have it off the top of your head, but, there are, but it's not just the raises. Correct. Okay. Can you tell me what the raises are going to cost us? Do you have that or you want to get back to me on it? <coughs> okay, while you're looking up that one, I'm going to ask the 
I am as confused as they come regarding these the FTEs and how many we have and how many we don't have. And so I wrote it down. I said, we're going to cut 60 FTEs funded by grants, and then we're going to put them back along with the funding. Once the budget is finally adopted, this all happens. I want to know the net impact, and then after that, once the grant funding and the FTAs it pays for are eliminated and then restored, what's the net dollar amount of the reductions to the department's budget, and what is the net number of FTEs being eliminated? Sure. And this I am year, totally confused. I have no idea. <laughs> absolutely. In this year's budget, the net sworn FTE are 49. Okay. And the civilian FTE are 10. Okay, because it said in one place it was 21, and another it said 10 on the civilian. So that was another yeah, thing. Correct. It's, so it's, it's 10, 10 on civilian okay. and 49 on the sworn. All right. And then, Laney, is it the same figure on the pensions as it was for fire 9.81? Oh, it's different. It, it, it's different. Um, police is 9%. I'm sorry? 9%. So it's straight 9%. Correct. And nothing is being paid on that as of right now. That's so correct. Can you get, me, get back to me and tell me um, the, how much the department would save if that was happening? You don't have to give me that now. So later, okay? She has both. We have both numbers if you want them, Council Okay, Machine. all right. The 3.5% raise that's due July 1st is about $3.2 million. How much? $3.2 million. Okay. And the value of their uh, employee share of PERS is five million eight hundred thousand. Five million eight hundred. Okay, five point eight. Okay. Pardon me. That that no that that's that's the whole nine percent right? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. It, is. Yeah. it would be discounted a little because we won't get anything out of the grant funded positions. It's slightly different. We'll recover less, but that's the approximate number. Okay. Okay, I on Sacramento talked about the release time, and I, I talked about that about fire, so I guess I, I need to say it again about police also. There's, there's according to Betty Masuoka, there's about 75% of the million plus that's going to SPOA. Are we looking at that at all? I mean, in all unions that, that I know, 95% um, of them pay it out of their dues. And you're referring to the release time and how uh -huh. it's funded between the city? The that, union that, release time. That, that is a conversation I believe is occurring at the uh, negotiations table. Okay. Um, do, is there any report that we get on the amount of union business that's going on? I mean, do they report how many grievances and how many hours and, and like that? Because I know FIRE just gives them a general. We, we get a general number on the hours of release time compared to vacation, holiday, and that. We don't get a breakdown as to far within the release time, what functions they're performing within that release time. Okay, and, and as far as the MOUs that, that uh, ION Sacramento had, most of us weren't here, and if we were here, we didn't see them anyway. They didn't come to council, so that's why some of that is in effect. But as for the car, I don't believe SPOA has any cars anymore. Is that correct? That's correct. They have no cars. Okay, they did have one, but it's no longer there. Correct. Okay. All right. Um, I think that's – no, I asked for vacant funded positions from the fire, and I'd like to know the same on the police. Okay? That takes care of my questions. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Vice Mayor Ashby. Hey, Chief. Thanks for your presentation. So I have a few questions, and I'm going to do the best I can here to put them together. They come from a few different – some of the workshops and some of the briefings, and I'm going to try to consolidate it here and see if I can get some direction. I sh on this particular budget, I'm really grateful for the city manager's new strategy to give us a chance to look at stuff because I feel like we need a little more time. I feel like they, the folks need a little more time to talk. And so I'm, I am, uh, I don't have, you know, quite a, a sense of direction on this yet, so I'm hoping that those conversations go along a little bit more smoothly. But I did want to answer at least one question I heard from a community member, and that is, you know, sometimes people want to come in here and compare unions, 522 to SPOA or fire to police or whatever, and I just would say you have to be really careful about that, and this is where the conversation about revenue generation came in, because the fire department has the ability to generate revenue in some areas, like they charge for ambulances or they charge for things that the police department cannot charge for. So just fundamentally looking at the two departments, fire is always going to have less reliance, and they should have less reliance on the general fund than police. Police are always going to be more reliant on the general fund 
because police service is not something that you know we charge people for when you go you obviously you know you don't want to have to uh, be paying people that would never work that's not a system that would work so that's why it's a tax-based system so I just would say that's how that conversation came up well, you might have felt a little confused because the fire discussion happened immediately preceding this right before an earlier meeting so that's uh, one thing and then on the issue of realignment and parolees and reentry, which I heard brought up several times and council member Sheedy asked a question about it I have a slight departure from the chief's position on that but um, I would just say that uh, parole is something that I have an area that I've worked in a lot in my my career before coming to City Council and I have had a lot of opportunities to work with corrections and since I've been here in the capacity of City Council and the reentry discussion has come out they have reached out to me and I am anxious and the chief has been a partner to me on this and I'm anxious to try to pull together something that allows the city of Sacramento to be a pilot for corrections at least moving forward working with parolees which is a different population than the realignment population that being said every county was given an amount of money allocation from the state and every county has a reentry commission like ours and every county had to determine what to do with those dollars what was the best use of those dollars in the chief's right in each county it was it could be different what you need based on how many people you had coming back and how much money you were getting but many other counties did put funding towards city police officers and I disagree with the reentry council's decision not to give the city of Sacramento funding for police officers and if there is an opportunity to readdress that I think that we should I know that there's a big commitment towards housing of inmates because of the great number that we have returning that need to be housed still and not just going into the community by housing meaning incarcerated so more beds incarceration but I think that we are missing the boat on two things there one reentry programs to stabilize people as they come out of the facility thus reducing our own recidivism rate and two the police officers who will be heavily impacted in by far the largest city inside of the county and most assuredly the city with the communities that these folks will be returning to so I think that we need to look for more opportunities sooner to be more aggressive about our role and potential value in that conversation and I'm happy to help you with that if there's anything that that I can do in the conversations that we're having with corrections um, then I just would like to ask a couple of questions about the police department in general so 3.2 million dollars is the price tag of the raise that they have coming to them right now right Laney what percentage is that three and a half and and chief how far I know that the average police officer in the city of Sacramento is underpaid at the median rate but do you know can you give us an idea of by how much this is another place where we have a little disadvantage because we don't have a report on this on fire we just had a report so can you tell us what the average wage for police you're, officers in the you're region looking at the cost of an officer we, we use a hundred thousand as an average it, it's going to fluctuate um, the, the folks you're laying off make less than you know than the median but for rough budging purposes we use right around a hundred what I'm really asking you for mm -hmm. is in other cities similar to Sacramento mm -hmm. how much does an officer make and how much does an officer in the city of Sacramento make um, that I'd have to get back to you because I don't have the salary survey I think that's what um, Mark Gregerson's working on I do okay. know um, that we are near the bottom on total comp because we look at total compensation so we'll be near the bottom in the region for comparables okay in the region or in similar cities it's a combination thereof the okay. cities that were used in the past as we look at the region then we look at similar sized cities Fresno Anaheim etc and when you say a hundred thousand that I mean the average officer take, take home is what you know I don't know okay we use that for budgeting purposes um, that's that's the cost to the city of the officer obviously they don't get a hundred thousand dollars but that's for budgeting right. purposes it's a hundred thousand well, I'd be interested in what the average officer in SPOA not management actually takes home because it I think it makes a difference and sheds a light on what we're asking of them and also I'm very interested in those comparables so if you could bring those back to us that would be I think helpful in the conversation because you know it affects the decisions that they're able to move forward 
And then I just have a couple of questions for you or Lainey, whichever one of you you think uh, would be better. Is there room, and I don't want to negotiate, so I don't want to negotiate contracts. That's, that's not my goal up here. But I want to search for solutions. So my question to you two, and really you, Chief, is, is there anything, is there any rock we haven't uncovered here yet that might allow us a savings or something that we could use in discussions moving forward with the police officers union that would help enable the conversation moving forward? And I don't know enough to know what those things would be, but maybe um, PTA or fitness or cars. I I'm not sure why the conversation about cars didn't come back, but are there any police specific opportunities there that we haven't uncovered that could potentially color this conversation a different way moving forward? I, I think the things that you're mentioning are things that are and have been discussed on either side of the table, whether okay. it's the city side or the POA side. Um, are there cost-saving opportunities there or opportunities for, for conversation moving forward? Are there some things there that we don't haven't talked about or haven't uncovered? Yeah, and I think that's what um, Mark Gregerson and Aaron Donato are discussing at this time. It's those those are the, the things that, that 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 at the table are trying to figure out what, what's in the best interest of the city, what's in the best interest of the employees. I'm trying to dance around the uh, what's on the table without sure. getting in, in yeah, trouble. Yeah, no, and that's fine. Um, I, I understand. But those that. are part of those conversations is what benefits everybody and gets us where we need to be financially. Okay. Absolutely. I just want to add, I think everybody has been willing to say, what's on your list, what's on your list, what's on a list that we can brainstorm together as long as it achieves permanent and ongoing savings. That's the goal. How we get there is as creative as we can all possibly be. Right. I think what my frustration is sort of sometimes we get stuck in the middle of this stuff even though we don't know the details. It's like we feel the frustration on both sides in a forum like this, right? So what I'm trying to understand is how two sides are having a, a very different sort of reaction to what ongoing savings is. And so maybe you could just say something about that. Sure. What um, We've identified a $15.7 million budget gap for this fiscal year. And our goal and the goal of the proposed budget is to close that in a permanent and ongoing way. So that once we close this $15 million, we know based on our, our uh, forecast for 13-14, we'll be dealing with another probably bottom seven, more than likely seven to ten because of the expectation of additional PERS costs. So we know that we, if we don't close that 15, that seven gets larger by the amount we don't close in a permanent and ongoing way um, in this fiscal year, in the 12-13 fiscal year. So from the, the we don't want to have to, it's as if, if we used one-time money to close the gap, we would be, have that same gap come back the very next fiscal year. So we want to make sure that when we talk about savings, that we're going to achieve this savings, if it's $2 million, we're going to achieve it in 12-13 and 13-14 and 14-15. Because to the extent that we cannot continue counting on those savings, the out-year deficits get bigger. So, for example, when we hold out positions for a short period of time, say two years or something, that's a temporary savings? Correct. Okay. So if you gave something, for example, if uh, I gave whatever, I think we already did, but, you know, our PERS, let's say I gave more PERS, then, but I asked for a raise less than the amount that I was giving, would that not be ongoing? Because the portion in between should be ongoing, right? If, well, and, and there is an exception to that. A 3% PERS pickup costs less than a 3% salary raise. So we have to remember that a 2% raise can cost as much as a 3% PERS pickup because we have all of the benefits that, that go along with a salary increase. Right, which comes so, back to the reason why we did the PERS. Exactly. That in the exactly. Okay. And, and, and for public safety, it's closer to 45 to 50%. Um, more on the salary side than on the purse pickup side. So you and have so to be working with the same number. So if you one group is subtracting out and then adding back in, you have to use not the percentage but the dollar figure. But the dollar that figure percentage represents specifically associated with salary, or the dollar figure specifically associated with the purse pickup. Okay. So so sure, you could say if I'm going to um, do a purse pickup of of nine percent. 
and I'm going to ask for salary of less than that, there will be a delta, but is the delta big enough to close the target? And, and therein lies some of the struggles I believe that we've had. Okay. Okay, so I guess we just, you know, we, we need a little more time here to work through some of these issues, I think. But from my perspective, I would just ask that we be as creative as we can in terms of these conversations and try to enter into them with a bit of an open mind on all of the possibilities because we really cannot afford to lose more. Last year, all of CSO, all of CSI, all of POP, over 100 officers. I just, you know, it's, it's really difficult to allow more officers off of the force. I just don't know there's going to be a, a point here where we can't recover from that. And I, I want to make sure that we include that human element into this discussion too and not just budget numbers. We, at some point we have to find another way. Okay, that's it for me. All right, any other questions from council? Um, go on once, twice. Chief, let me ask just one simple question. Um, it may have already been addressed, but how many uh, positions are currently vacant? <laughs> that's, a, that's a good question. Some of them are vacant um, because we're holding them for anticipated savings. Some of them are unfunded vacancies, um, so it's not as simple as it sounds. For example, five positions from regional transfer are vacant, but they were funded previously, which means we're not getting revenue in and there's no expenditures, so they're vacant, but they're really not truly funded. There, so right now we're at funded vacancies, something like that. Yeah, we're 15 or 16 actual true funded vacancies. And then the other, the untrue. <laughs> then we've got. <laughs> well, it's nine, really those 20, five that are kind correct. of throwing us it, off. It, it's going to be. It's going to be 20. There's total 20. So you do. So it's 15. That would that would leave five that are kind of unfunded but vacant. Thank you, sir. Okay. I don't mean to be vague, but we're also anticipating reductions in some of the other um, uh, sexy unified and some of the other positions that are looking like they're going to have to scale back. So we're holding those in anticipation of losing them. Um, so there's like three different categories we're working with right now on, on the budget itself. In the, uh, do you know how many you're holding? Yeah, we're holding six. Six. So 15 and five and six being held. Yeah, the, the, the issue is that, and we've tried to be really good on a citywide basis, when we have a contract or a grant that's associated with FTE, when those funds go away, so do the FTE that were taken on as part of providing those services. So they've got six associated with the contracts, five associated with the RT. RT. Yeah, so that's 11, and then there are, I believe, 15 true other Vacancy. So that would be the 15 is the number when you say of the 49 that we're proposing to eliminate, 15 of those are vacant. Do gotcha. we subtract five? And that was a total of 26. So. Yes. Okay. Yeah, and then we also have some people anticipating retiring. So it actually is a moving target. Every week it changes Got it. as far as it increases the number of funded vacancies based on retirements. All right, we appreciate the update. So thanks, Chief. All right, we're now on to uh, our parks which is our proposed budget on parks and recreation. I'm assuming the one, there he is. Jim Combs, you